What is obstetric fistula? As someone living in a developed or higher income country, you may have the privilege of not needing to know. But for women living in rural communities of a country like the DRC, Nepal, or Rwanda, this condition can turn their world upside down. In this episode, I chat with Jesse Chu, Program Manager of Fistula Foundation, an organization that provides treatment to women with devastating childbirth injuries, one being obstetric fistula. So today we'll answer the simple question, what is obstetric fistula? I'm going to call episodes like this my Global Health 101 series. So make sure you're subscribed because next week we continue our conversation with Jessie to learn about her journey into the world of serving women through Fistula Foundation and how they're providing life-changing care to women all around the world. Let's get right into it. My name is Hethel Baman and this is the Global Health Pursuit. I just want to go very, very basic now for anyone who's listening who doesn't know What's fistula? <laughs> yeah. Can you explain what is that condition? Of course, yes. Fistula is a childbirth injury that happens when women have a prolonged or obstructed labor. So during labor, the baby's head will continue to press on the soft tissue of the woman's pelvic floor. And if the baby can't, if she can't give birth and that baby just continues to press on that tissue, it restricts the flow of blood. And because the blood can't get to the tissue, the tissue will eventually die and it will leave a hole. And so that hole, if it's between the woman's vagina and bladder, it means that she will uncontrollably leak urine through her vagina until that hole is repaired. The hole could also be between her rectum and her vagina, which means that she would uncontrollably leak feces through the hole until it's repaired. We don't really have this issue in the United States because if a woman was in in obstructed labor, she would have emergency obstetric care, like a C-section. Exactly. So it really only happens in places where women can't access a C-section. That's the primary reason that fistula exists. So it could be that, you know, there's just, there's, we call it, there's multiple delays that are possible. Perhaps there's a delay in seeking care. If maybe she Mm -hmm. has having, giving birth without skilled birth attendant, or it could be a delay when she reaches the facility, if the facility is really packed and doesn't realize what an emergency situation she's in. So there's multiple points at which it can be challenging for a woman to receive adequate care. Actually, I find this to be a fascinating fact. The Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City, which is like a luxury hotel, was actually the site of a fistula hospital. But it closed in 1895 because there was a lack of cases because women were able to receive the care that they needed. So this used to be an issue that we would experience in the United States, but now it really only exists predominantly in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, where women might not be able to get the emergency obstetric care that they need. And so in these situations, like it could be that the woman maybe like the clinic is too far away or like if, if she's using a midwife, right? Like at home and there's. Yeah. I think in a lot of cases we do find that midwives would ideally know, or at least a trained midwife would know to get her to a care facility. Gotcha. But often if she's having labor at home with like a traditional yeah, birth attendant of some kind, maybe that person wouldn't realize that the care, the situation is very urgent. There's some mixed data. So I am not entirely sure about this, but we do see that generally the woman has been in labor for more than two days when a fistula develops. So it's really a very long period where you're seeing that, you know, she's, the baby is trying to come out and just cannot maybe because the baby is too large or the woman is small, but it would just be a situation where she requires a C-section and can't get one. Two days. Yeah. I can't, I mean, I don't have kids, but I can't remember. I I know. Even imagine being in labor for two whole days. Without an epidural or any kind of anesthesia or anything. It just. Oh my gosh. So, so painful and difficult. 
So, okay, so the the tear happens because of this prolonged pregnancy or the prolonged labor, you said. Now, a woman's in labor. She develops this tear. Says she doesn't have access to a C-section or, like, surgical care. Is she still able to deliver? How does that yeah. how does that work? So tragically in 90% of cases the baby is stillborn because she's unable to deliver without a C-section. But as you can imagine, it's just absolutely traumatic for the women who have experienced this. You know, they have lost their child that I'm sure they were very much looking forward to having in most cases. They are now have this injury, their body has been really damaged by this prolonged and obstructed labor. They're leaking urine and feces. And many women don't know that it's connected to the difficult labor. You know, a lot of misinformation and stigma around fistula. So women might think that they were cursed or that, um, yeah, they just might not realize that it's connected to that and that it's a medical injury that can be treated. And so there's so much shame and trauma, depression, anxiety, and isolation that's related with to this. If you don't realize that it's a treatable medical injury, you might not realize that you should or can go seek treatment. And so actually in the women that Fistula Foundation treats, on average, they have wait the time between when they develop fistula and when they finally receive treatment is five years. Wow. Um, so women will live with this for five years where they're uncontrollably leaking urine and feces or one or both. Or, yeah. And you know, that obviously has a smell associated with it. There's physical consequences of leaking urine through your vagina. Um, there's really, you know, difficult emotional and social consequences because of the shame with the smell and with the um, being. And then that also has economic consequences for women where I hear stories all the time of women who, you know, were selling vegetables at the market, but now no one wants to buy from them because people think that she's un- unclean or unsanitary. And so then she, you know, it's very difficult for women to earn an income when they're living with fistula. So it has all these really devastating consequences for an individual woman, but also for her family. In many cases, the woman has successfully given birth before. So she may already have children, even where, you know, where she had a successful pregnancy and labor. And now, you know, it's so much more difficult for her to care for those children because she's you know, dealing with all of these terrible consequences of having fistula. So yeah, it's just really difficult for the woman and for her family and yeah, very devastating for communities. And what I find shocking is that that we estimate that about a million women live with this condition worldwide. So for something that is so preventable and also so treatable, it is just I think such a injustice that women are living with this today. And I feel really proud to get to be part of trying to make sure that they get the care that they need by working at Fistula Foundation. I think, I mean, I think that's just a crazy statistic. One million women. What are the other physical effects that having Fistula Yeah, I don't think that fistula would lead to death. Women can live with it for a very long time, but it would definitely lead to other physical challenges. So I hear about a lot is that because women are experiencing so much shame and isolation, many women will, you know, not want to leave their homes or will spend most of their time in bed. And then that will lead to a lot of physical challenges. Yeah, just really ulcers and things like that. Yeah, things like that. There's some other associated illnesses. I am honestly, I don't have enough of a medical background to speak to it, but I know that it's related to something called vaginal stenosis, neurological disorders. There are a number of other physical ailments that are associated with fistula as well. How are these women dealing with that? Because I mean, I'm, I'm almost thinking about that the stigma of even having a period in like rural India, right? Yeah. And like, that's kind of like, they don't have access, like a lot of them don't have access to sanitary materials, yep. right? So, and then you see them where using 
really dirty rags, you know, and then developing infection off of that and things like that. So how are these women kind of doing the same thing just to try to prevent, you know, from smelling or things like that? Yeah, that's a great point. And yes, I have heard stories like that. Another one that I've heard is that women will severely dehydrate themselves so that they won't leak any urine. What? Yeah, that I think is very common. Many women are severely, severely dehydrated because they don't want to, you know, walk around and be leaking. They're trying to hide this condition, trying not to smell. Um, So I think, yes, trying to not consume any liquids, but also then unsanitary solutions to try to block it or keep it in. Some women you hear just like never want to leave the house. Yeah, I think it's it's just absolutely devastating. And it's it's it can be repaired through a single surgery in most cases. So it's just, you know, feels like it should not be happening because it's right. so preventable and so treatable. Um, but this is not even like they don't like these women don't under like know that, you know. Yeah. That the the fact that you said that there's a stigma of maybe even being cursed, right? Like quote unquote being yes. cursed that I had this child and now I'm cursed and all of this. And that, I think that that's a, that's something that, you know, without the, the education behind it and like the knowledge behind all of this stuff, it's like, it's really hard to live with. And yeah. so I want to ask you like, what, what does that surgery look like? Yeah, so it can be very different for different women and the different types of injuries. But in most cases, it's generally a pretty simple repair. You do need specific training and fistula surgery to be able to provide this care. So we work together with FIGO. They're the International Federation of Gynecologists and Obstetric Surgeons, and they have a fistula surgery training initiative. So we work together with them. Um, They have a really well-developed curriculum and expert fistula surgeons who are trainers and mentors. And then they bring on a number of fellows every year into their program from around the world trained in fistula surgery. So in most cases, it can be repaired through a single procedure. Some women will need multiple procedures if they have a really complex case, or sometimes if they have injury that is between the bladder and the vagina is called a vesicovaginal fistula. And the injury that's between the rectum and the vagina is called a rectovaginal fistula. And some women could have both. Sometimes you might need a procedure for one and then a second procedure for the other, depending on the case. So some women do need multiple repairs, but in most cases it is treated with a single surgery. And in our data of the women that we support the treatment for, 88% of the surgeries result in the fistula being closed and the woman being continent. In most cases, yeah, highly effective um, and, you know, then really transformative for women to be able to go back and kind of live normally. This might be a little bit too technical, but with the surgery, is it just like inserting like a mesh that kind of just covers the facial location or Mm -hmm. are they suturing, suturing the hole up and then like putting that mesh? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, so um, I actually think that sometimes they're able to use tissue from another part of the body to fill the hole in that area, but it is a very intricate vaginal surgery. So that's why you need to make sure that you have an expert surgeon who is providing it so that no additional harm is done. And we've found that the first attempt at surgery is generally the woman's likeliest chance of being cured. And so we never want a surgeon who is underskilled to attempt that right. first surgery. The, I will also just clarify. So fistula foundation, we also support another type of injury, which is called a third or fourth degree perennial tear. And that's a tear where the tissue hasn't died. And so that can actually, I think, just be sutured up. Mm-hmm. Um, and that tear mm-hmm. is very common. It's one of the most common birth-related injuries. It happens in the U.S. all the time as well. That's usually when a woman is giving birth and the baby is maybe a little bit too large and will tear that delicate tissue. But usually you're just sutured up right uh, when you're in the hospital giving birth. Then for a lot of women in 
the countries where we work, that doesn't happen. And so right. then they continue living with it. And they also experience leaking and many of the same social consequences that women with fistula experience. But it is technically a slightly different injury. And I think a little bit more straightforward to treat because the tissue still exists. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you'd like to learn more about today's topic and guest, head over to the show notes linked in the description of this episode. There you can get access to resources, links, and ways you can get involved in the pursuit for global health. And if you love this episode, don't forget to write me a review on Apple Podcasts and rate the podcast on Spotify. It helps me get in front of more people just like you and continues to elevate the causes we are so passionate about. I'll see you in the next one.